Okay. <clears throat> so let's recap what we talked about. If I can get my mask to stir where it needs to be. Um, let's talk about what we uh, discussed yesterday. It was what was basically the main and really only topic that we discussed yesterday. What specifically did we talk about? Ha ah, specific heat. Yes. We discussed specific heat and we saw how we can calculate specific heat. We also did a brief calc uh, look into how we calculated molar heat, okay, um, where we took um, the specific heat of the substance and multiplied it by the molar mass. Today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at calorimetry, okay? The process is nearly identical, okay, but it does have one to two very small added steps. I'm going to break those down for you, okay? And so when I do the work um, on my whiteboard, after we look at their example, I recommend that you do it in the same fashion, okay? Because when you break things down into small steps, it makes it a little uh, easier to uh, grasp. But anyway, when we are <clears throat> looking at calorimetry, everything is gonna be conducted in what's called constant pressure. Why is everything conducted at constant pressure? At least in our scenario, in our case. What's providing pressure right now? Air or the atmosphere, exactly. And so all of our experiments that we run are conducted out in the open. So everything is subject to air pressure. We're not putting our experiments into vacuum chambers or uh, other chambers that can increase pressure, no. We call it constant pressure because it's gonna be fairly constant from the moment we begin the experiment to the moment where we complete it, okay? And granted, for <clears throat> experiments that go on for multiple days, there might be some fluctuations um, in the, the air pressure, but there, there are also laboratories that are designed to also be able to maintain that as well. So anyway, um, by carrying out a reaction in aqueous solution in a sample, or sorry, in a simple calorimeter such as this one, one can indirectly measure the heat change for the system by measuring the heat change for the water in that calorimeter. I don't think I mentioned what this is called. This is called a coffee cup calorimeter, okay? And it's called that because it's literally made by using two coffee cups, two styrofoam coffee cups. You have a thermometer that's gonna be measuring the water temperature. Well, again, the water in these cases are gonna be the surrounding. The system will be a chemical reaction that's taking place within the water, okay? And we have this cork stopper in here to help make sure that we keep as much of the um, energy, the heat energy contained within that coffee cup so it doesn't escape and throw off our numbers, okay? And again, we use the styrofoam because styrofoam insulates, okay? We use two styrofoam cups to get the, as much uh, insulation as we possibly can. And there you have it. You have a pretty uh, significant yet simple scientific contraption with just a few things that you might have lying around your house. You never know. So <clears throat> yesterday, I believe I mentioned, I'm not certain if I mentioned, but we calculate um, the heat flow in uh, calorimeter by a nearly identical equation that we saw yesterday, okay? Um, where we have Q, what's Q stand for again? What's it, st what's it stand in place for? Heat, very good, heat transfer. Okay, so <clears throat> we're looking at how we calculate the heat that is transferred, okay? And our focus is the reaction, okay? RxN stands for reaction. So the heat transferred of the reaction. So what we're looking at is that the reaction that's taking place or the system. Okay, everything is focused on the system, but we are measuring the surroundings which is the water. So, yeah, nearly identical equation to yesterday, but what difference do you notice? What's the small difference 
from this equation than from the one yesterday. The negative sign. That negative sign is very important when we're talking about calorimetry. Okay. Again, yesterday was specific heat. Today is calorimetry. Although very similar, we add that negative sign so that we can maintain the sign convention. Again, we are measuring the surroundings. We're not measuring the system, but we have to think in, in terms of the system. And so that's why we have this negative sign. For instance, okay, our change in temperature. Let's say our temperature increases, right? So that means the water got warmer, right? What does that mean in terms of what happened to the system? Did it absorb energy or release energy to water? What? Release! Yes! And so in terms of the system releasing energy, what sign must it have? Negative. That's a negative sign, by the way. Negative. And quick quiz. When the system releases energy, what is that process called? Remember, it's exiting. Exothermic! Yay! Very good. So yeah, that's why it's there. Because after all this is said and done, by adding that negative sign, we say, oh, the reaction's exothermic. Because, I mean, the water got warmer. But in terms of the system, it lost energy. Okay? Now, I'm going to stay with this now. What if we had a temperature decrease? Okay? So that means this delta T would be a negative number. Okay? So that means all this in here would be a negative product. Negative times a negative is a positive. So what happened to the system then? If it's a positive number, what happened? Did the did that system absorb or release energy? Absorb, and it's called a what process? Endothermic, yes, because the energy goes into the system. Very good. So they are typically, or these values are typically going to be reported in kilojoules per mole. Okay, typically. Okay, over the years, <coughs> excuse me, your book's kind of going back and forth. Okay, just. What I recommend you do is pay careful attention to what the questions are asking, okay? Um, that's why I don't say always reported in kilojoules per mole. I say typically reported in kilojoules per mole, okay? Um, if you have any questions as to, you know, how it should be, um, you can ask me or um, you could, like, say, for instance, the quiz, if there's something like there, just err on the side of caution, put it in kilojoules per mole, okay? And I always, again, I hand grade everything. So if I see that there may be some um, confusion there, I can always adjust accordingly, okay? Let's look at a practice problem here. Okay, now these problems are gonna be a little lengthier, slightly lengthier than what we saw yesterday, okay? The key to these is again, picking out what you need to know. So here, when a student mixes 50 milliliters of 1.0 molar, hydrochloric acid and 50 milliliter of 1.0 molar sodium hydroxide in a coffee cup calorimeter, the temperature of the resultant solution increases from 21 degrees to 27.5 degrees Celsius. Again, we're right here. Okay. Those of you at home, if you don't know, we are asked to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction in terms of kilojoules per mole. So right there, it tells you. Okay, so our answer has to be in kilojoules per mole of hydrochloric acid. Assuming that the calorimeter loses only a negligible quantity of heat, negligible to the point where we don't have to take into consideration the amount of heat that it could possibly lose. The total volume of the solution is 100 milliliters, that its density is 1.0 grams per milliliter, and its specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Okay. So let's look at how we can determine the values of our variables, okay? Because we're going back to this equation, so we have to figure out all of these values, okay? So determine its mass. We were told that the <clears throat> volume, the total volume is 100 milliliters, okay? We're also given the density of 1.0 grams per milliliter. 
If we go ahead and take the 100 milliliters and multiply it by that 1.0 grams per milliliter, what happens to those milliliter units? They cancel out, leaving us with what? Grams, right? So sometimes you might have to look for that information, you know, look for volume, look for density. Other times you're going to be given the mass. So again, just read the questions carefully. So yeah, we have a 100 gram sample here. Next, our temperature change. Our final temperature is 27.5 degrees Celsius. Our initial is 21.0 degrees Celsius. Again, it's final minus initial. So we get an overall temperature change of 6.5 degrees Celsius, or we can easily convert that to 6.5 Kelvin. So we've got our temperature change, we've got our mass of our substance, and we are told what the specific heat of our substance is. It basically, it's just water, okay? So using the equation from this slide, making sure that we have that negative sign, <clears throat> we go ahead and plug in our values. Again, don't forget that this C sub S is just simply specific heat, okay? Don't, don't let that throw you off, okay? So after all it's said and done, we get negative 2.7 times 10 to the third joules, okay? Well, again, We've got that negative sign there, so we can imagine, we already know that the water increases, the surroundings increase, so this is going to be what type of reaction? If we have a negative sign here, it's going to be a exothermic, very good. Okay, what they do here, okay, after they've calculated the amount of heat um, change here in joules, you notice that they go one more step and go ahead and convert to kilojoules. Why do they convert to kilojoules right here? 1,000, but look at the question here. It asks us for kilojoules per mole. So we need kilojoules, okay? But we need this mole part. So our next step after we've determined the kilojoules is to simply figure out how many moles do we have present, okay? Well, again, we're in, we're in terms of hydrochloric acid. In the problem, we were told that we had 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid in a concentration of 1.0 molar, um, yeah, 1.0 molar concentration. Does anybody remember this formula from, I think it's last chapter, molarity, where we have, oh, uh, this program doesn't give me the, uh, doesn't give me the, um, pen. Anyway, write this down for a reminder, okay? Molarity, which is capital M, is equal to moles over liter. Moles divided by liter. Does that, does that ring a bell at all? We're talking about concentration? Does that ring a bell? Uh-oh. Does that ring a bell? Oh, no! Okay. Anyway, molarity is the concentration of a solution, okay? And it is solved by taking the amount of moles divided by the volume in liters, okay? So anyway, that's what from chapter four, but we're seeing it again here. So we have 50 milliliters, our volume is 50 milliliters, but we have to be in liters, okay? So we convert milliliters to liters. Next. We know that our concentration is 1.0 molarity, or if we broke it down, it's 1.0 moles per liter. And so in order to solve for moles, you're gonna take that formula I just gave you and rearrange it to solve for moles. So you take the volume in liters, multiplied by the concentration or the molarity, the liters cancel out, and you have 0 0.05 moles. The last step you need to do is take that negative 2.7 kilojoules that we just solved in the previous step, divide it by the moles, 
and you get your negative 54 kilojoules per mole. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do one together. Okay? <clears throat> so make sure you have your calculator ready because, not going to lie, my work that's in my notebook, I have scribbled and scribbled and scribbled quite a bit. So I might need some double checking here. Um, anyway, when 50... 0 0.0 milliliters of 0 0.100 molar silver nitrate, or right here, and 50 milliliters of 0 0.100 molar hydrochloric acid are mixed in a constant pressure calorimeter. The temperature of the mixture increases from 22.30 degrees Celsius to 23.11 degrees Celsius. The temperature increase is caused by the following reaction. We are asked to calculate the change in enthalpy, or delta H, in kilojoules per mole for the reaction in silver nitrate. So that is our focus right here, silver nitrate. Assuming that the combined solution has a mass of 100 grams, and again, a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram Celsius. Okay, so keep that handy, because we're going to go and solve this question together. Okay, so... The first thing we're gonna do, okay? I'm gonna label this, oops, that's a little bright. Okay, that should be good. So the first thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna label it first. First step is we're going to write our equation, okay? So that's the equation we're gonna work with. Mass times specific heat times change in temperature and then make sure you have that uh, negative sign there. Before I get into calculating here, okay, I'm going to, on the side, I'm just going to write down my units or my variables because this helps me keep everything straight, okay? So heat is what we're trying to figure out, okay? <clears throat> our mass, what's our mass? Can anybody find that information? What's our mass? Hundred grams, very good. It tells us right there the problem. Specific heat, we are told, four point one eight joules per gram Kelvin. And now our temperature change. You know, temperature change is final minus initial. Our final was twenty three point one one degrees Celsius. Our initial was twenty two point three degrees Celsius. So, what is my change in temperature? I want you to calculate this because honestly, mine is worn away. Like I've scribbled too much on this one. So I need your help. I know it's small. Thank you. 0 0.81 degrees Celsius, which we can just easily change to 0 0.81 Kelvin. So we've got everything that we need to calculate this. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. Our mass was 100 grams. Our specific heat was 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. And the temperature change was 0 0.81 Kelvin. So again, I'm trying to read my writing Double check my work, but I think it's negative 381 when you round. Jules, double check for me. So what you got? What'd you get? Three thirty-nine. Yeah. I'm gonna show you what my handwriting looks like. See, that's why I have difficulty trying to figure it out. So, three thirty-nine. Yeah, negative negative three thirty-nine. Okay, excellent. 
That's why you participate. <laughs> All right, so negative 339 joules. But we're going to follow the, very, the same steps I did. We're going to go ahead, since we need to have our answer in kilojoules per mole, we're going to have to convert this to kilojoules, okay? So one kilojoule over 1,000 joules. And so what do we get in terms of kilojoules for Q? Awesome. Thank you. So 0 0.339 kilojoules. Okay. That's our first step. Second step. We need to figure out number of moles of silver nitrate. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, we need to look at how much do we have of silver nitrate. Okay. So going back to the problem, we were told that we have 50 milliliters of silver nitrate. Okay. So 50 milliliters needs to be converted to liters. So in our volume was 50.0 milliliters. You can convert that. Oh, you can't see that. So 50 milliliters divided by 1,000, you're going to get 0 0.05 liters. And our molarity that we're given in the problem was 0 0.100 moles per liter. Now, again, I'm going to take that formula of molarity is equal to moles over liter and rearrange it to solve for moles. So I'm going to have moles is equal to molarity times liter. So now I'm going to calculate. I'm going to put in my uh, values here. Molarity is 0 0.100 moles per liter multiplied by my volume in liters, which is 0 0.05 liters. And so what is my... How many moles do I have presently? Should have 0 0.005 moles, right? OK, so I've got my heat energy. I've got my moles. The third step is to go ahead and finish this calculation in terms of kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to H a reaction um, in kilojoules per mole. All you got to do is take your negative 0 0.339 kilojoules divided by 0 0.005 moles. And you should get I think I have the right answer. Negative sixty seven point seven one six kilojoules per mole. Again, double check that for me. Is that right? Oh, okay, 67.8. I'll take your word on it. I think it's 67.8. And that would be your answer for this question. So there's a few steps involved, um, but again, to break it down into small calculations, pay careful attention to what you have for um, your information in the problem. 
Okay, take it slow. Don't try to rush through it. Okay, but that's how you solve for calorimetry. And so that brings us to an end of... Did you need to see that still? Okay, that brings us to an end of chapter five. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, I got to figure out how to do this. Okay, so... Anyway, tomorrow, don't forget that you have a quiz over sections four and five. You do not have problem set questions from section four, and your problem set will be due tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> your problem set's not going to be due until 11.59, okay, usual. Um, but, you know, so, and so your quiz is also due, well, for those of you at home, 1159 just get it i would recommend that you do it during your class time that way you don't have to worry about it um but do, 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 do. can't think what i was gonna say oh yeah there'll be everything on classroom tomorrow for everybody the some uh, submission link for your uh, problem set and then your quiz will be there tomorrow make sure you have a calculator um notes anything you might need for this okay um and that's that so for those of you at home, I thank you for attending. I'll be seeing you tomorrow for some of you. Um, you may now disconnect. I am going to stop recording.